Today, it's my honor to introduce our guest speaker, and he has been in the news of late in a good way. You might have heard about the Rotunda Restoration Project. You might have heard about the chimney and fireplace repair on the lawn. You might have heard about the 64 undiscovered graves or the unrecorded grave sites in our cemetery. And if you heard about any of those news stories, you also read Jody Lahendra's name. So Jody Lahendra is UVA's historic preservation architect. And in this role, he manages the projects for over 120 historic buildings. Prior to joining UVA in 2004, Jody led his own private practice in Richmond for 18 years. He received his bachelor's at Virginia Tech and his master's in architectural history from the University of Virginia. Please join me in welcoming Jody to kick off the More Than the Score 2013 lecture series. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. It's hard to realize and believe that after a devastating fire, in 1895 and a complete interior gutting in 1976. The Rotunda would still today have secrets to share from Thomas Jefferson's time. Yet within the last few months as research for the remaining renovations was being conducted, a consulting architect working in the Lower East Oval Room had the bright idea to look up in the oven opening exposed in 1976 one of those two oven openings that uh, have been there since 76. And when he did, he was transported back in time through careful and methodical research that is ongoing. We are gradually re-exposing a sophisticated niche for with four oven ap apertures used for chemical experiments in the chemistry classroom that occupied this room when the rotunda was first opened in 1827. Um, this is a photo of that wall now that we're stripping away the plaster. It shows the outline of the niche and then as we're taking away the brick very carefully, we're getting peaks inside. This is to the left. This is a workstation with two apertures for an oven and what, we, what you saw on the outside was actually just the firebox that provided the heat for these apertures where chemical experiments would go on. This is to the left, and this is to the right inside that opening. And a working drawing of what we know so far shows the layout here with the four apertures and then the flue coming from it. Uh, the fireboxes below, and the fireboxes have a very sophisticated tunnels going to the outside of the building for fresh air intake to be able to feed those uh, 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 fires. Um, and stay tuned, because just two days ago, uh, a conservator looking through one of the probes we just recently made above this found a piece of paper from 1976 work that shows framing for two more apertures at some of the ends of these rooms in the basement. So the, the, the discoveries are still happening. It's an honor for me to kick off this year's More Than the Score lecture series and a pleasure to share with you the work on the rotunda. Now nearly eight years after planning began, a year and a half after phase one construction started, and about three years before construction will be finally completed. I'm going to start with a brief overview of the Rotunda's eventful past before discussing the planning that went into the phase one work that is just now finishing with a step-by-step -step look at the actual roof and exterior repairs construction. Lastly, I'll describe the planning and scope of work just beginning for the remaining renovations of the rotunda. This drawing graphically illustrates the complicated construction history that is today's rotunda. After one appalling addition, one catastrophic fire, one heavy-handed exterior renovation, and two so-called restorations that gutted the building. Uh, I should explain this. The Portion in red is what's left of Jefferson's uh, uh, original uh, building uh, left after the fire of 1895. 
in yellow is the McKim Mead and White uh, additions, 1895 to 97. In green, in the late 1930s, uh, the, ter the, the terraces, the floors of the porticos, and the steps were all uh, redone. And then lastly, the blue is the restoration of 1976, where they gutted the entire building. Knowledge today of the 1827 rotunda, I'm sorry, of the rotunda constructed by Jefferson is limited and incomplete. Documentation mostly relies upon a handful of extant planning drawings made by Jefferson and his workmen without knowing what was actually built. Some 19th century photographs of the exterior and dome room and contemporary etchings. What is clear, though, is that unlike the rest of the academical village, today's rotunda is very different from the original. This is graphically going to show you how things have changed over time. This is Jefferson's original rotunda facing the lawn. It had two south wings and a south portico, and then the rotunda itself. This was all the backyard of, of the rotunda. University Avenue is up here. 18 95 to 97, McKim Mead and White puts on the north portico. They also put on the north wings of the rotunda, and then the colonnades connecting the wings, the north and the south wings. They also uh, constructed the courtyards uh, uh, in, in the middle of those wings. And the north terrace is mostly their work, along with some mid-20th century work. Uh, and then additions beyond that expand the entire scope of the rotunda. You see how much has changed. The rotunda was originally constructed between 1822 and 1827, one year after Jefferson's death. The concept of a prominent building at the head of the lawn was initially recommended by Latrobe, but it was Jefferson's genius to adapt the half-size evocation of, Rome, of the Roman pantheon to the materials, setting, and programmatic needs of a university. When placed into service, the Rotunda's dome room, which is the drawing on the right, was the, was the university's library. On the first floor, in the, set, in the center, a museum of natural history and a room for various school uses. And in the ground floor, chemistry classrooms. The repair of deteriorated, deteriorating building elements began even before final completion of Jefferson's building. Fireplaces smoked and both the roof and skylight leaked badly, damaging books and inconveniencing students. Later 19th century photos like this one show the absence of steps on the roof, thought to have been originally constructed as a stacked series of short painted wood screens that would have deteriorated easily and a series of cupolas constructed over the oculus to stop the leaking skylight. Despite the inconveniences, university enrollment grew rapidly in the mid-19th century from 128 students in 1842 to 645 in 1857. In 1850, the university buildings were only able to accommodate a student population of 200. In response to this growth, a large wing, designed by Robert Mills, was added to the rotunda's rear north elevation. Universally disliked, then and now, the four-story annex was completed in 1854 and housed many classrooms, laboratories, storage rooms, and a large auditorium. And it is when the annex was built that we think the chemistry classrooms uh, in the basement of the rotunda were closed down and moved to the annex. It was in the annex that the devastating fire that gutted the rotunda began early on Sunday morning, October 27, 1895. By three o'clock that afternoon, all that was left of the annex and rotunda was a brick shell. Scrubbed of all attached wood trim, remnants of the damaged Carrera marble Corinthian capitals still exist today in the Bailey courtyard. And they're as crisp today as when they were uh, carved in Italy. Uh, uh, for the rotunda. Two months after the fire, the university hired the New York firm of McKim, Mead & White, at that time the preeminent architectural firm in the United States, to guide the rotunda's re reconstruction. Though described as a restoration by the firm's principal in charge, Stanford White, 
The reconstructed rotunda was very different from Jefferson's original design. The upper two floors were now combined into one soaring library space with three levels of perimeter galleries, the lower two filled with bookcases. Other significant changes, some required by the BOV, include the addition of a north portico on what was formerly the rotunda's rear elevation, north side wings connected by colonnades to the original south wings, a terrace level walkway above the wings connecting the porticos, and a Guastavino tile dome with copper roofing and altered step configuration. Also at the BOV's direction, to replace the annex spaces, McKinley and White created three new buildings enclosing the lawn's south end, Old Cabell, Rouse, and Cock Halls. During the 20th century, a major project at the porticos and terraces began in 1920, uh, 1938, replaced McKim, Mead, and White's concrete steps, flooring, and railings with marble elements. At the same time, the transfer of books to the new Alderman Library removed the primary purpose of the rotunda. Immediately after the move, the first of many university committees began looking for appropriate new uses for the dome room, like a flower show. Against this backdrop of disuse and gradual deterioration, a campaign began in 1955 to, co quote, correct the alterations made by Stanford White and restore the rotunda interior to Jefferson's design, end quote. Ultimately, this resulted in the second restoration of the rotunda from 1935 to 1976. The man on the left just looks too happy doing what he's doing. <laughs> The focus of this project was two-pronged, to replace the McKim Mean White interior with an evocation of the original Jefferson interior, and to replace the skylight, dome roofing, and steps with something closer to Jefferson's design. Leo, is that you up there? No, not yet. Okay. <laughs> Leo worked on the project uh, as a youngster. In both cases, educated guesses took the place of precise documentation to recreate details of the original designs. It's been nearly 40 years since the major work of the 1970s. Over the past 20 years, significant deficiencies began reappearing in facility inspection reports that are prepared every few years. The turn-coated sheet steel roofing installed in 1976 began showing signs of rusting in the mid-1990s. Starting around 2000, a springtime ritual began to seal rusted holes with caulking and paint the entire roof to hide rust stains just before graduation. <laughs> Other reported deficiencies include water infiltration and mechanical spaces, rusting equipment, spalling concrete on the underside of portico steps, an elevator that frequently breaks down, cracking of the portico columns, bases, and high levels of humidity calling, causing mold growth in the dome room. It was clear that the rotunda's problems required more than the cyclical maintenance it was receiving. Knowing that a major intervention was imminent, the university retained the firm of John G. Waite Associates Architects in 2005 to perform a historic structure report for the rotunda. This report was completed two years later in 2007. An HSR is an essential first step before starting work on a historic building. This report thoroughly documents the resource, provides a history based upon archival and physical research, identifies significant historic features that must be preserved, and recommends remedial actions based upon an investigation and analysis of the condition problems. In addition to the problems noted earlier, the Rotunda's HSR identifies erosion of the portico capitals, operational problems of the mechanical equipment due to inaccessibility, brick and mortar damage resulting from efflorescing salts, and accelerated wear and tear in the dome room because of inadequate catering storage, to name just a few. The HSR recommendations laid out a roadmap for the university, which allowed planning to begin in earnest for implementing a capital pro project to renovate the rotunda. 
Repair and improvement recommendations were prioritized and construction costs projected. The total price tag of nearly $51 million suggested a multi-year effort. Yet, as noted in the HSR, active deterioration of historic features was ongoing due to the roof damage. At this point, it was decided to single out the roof replacement and exterior repairs portion of the project to be an early phase of the work. Initial funding was identified and architectural planning began in 2010. During the year-long planning and research, numerous probes were made to confirm construction details and investigate the condition of subsurface materials. Two of these probes cut slices through the dome roof features installed in 1976. From these, we learned that the steps were poured twice in 1976 to finally obtain a shape that seemed historically appropriate to those involved at the time. The yellow dashed line shows the first pour. Um, they stepped back, didn't like what they saw, and so they poured it again over top of that. Construction of the roof and exterior repairs phase of work began the day after graduation, 2012, 15 months ago. While contractually construction is not required to be completed for another couple of weeks, we accelerated portions of the work to allow removal of the scaffolding in time for our final exercises this past May 19th. The budget for this first phase of work is $7.2 million. Its scope divides into three major components. The roof replacement, exterior brick and window repairs, and ornamental sheet metal repairs. Now, I'm going to very quickly go through about 37 slides to show you the actual construction work that went on over the past 15 months. This is going to be quick. I've only allowed, I only have 10 minutes to do this, so forgive me. It's going to be like an MTV video. <laughs> Uh, first thing we start off with is uh, determining staging areas, access for the construction. The rotunda is, is uh, at, at the heart of the university, surrounded by pedestrian access. We had to figure a way of keeping the, the construction activity separate from the pedestrian activity. We did that in a way by creating in the laydown yard a tower that went to a bridge that crossed over the terrace level so that construction was above the pedestrians, went to another tower that went up to, the, to scaffolding that was at all levels of the dome, I mean at the drum of the building, and then went around the dome. Uh, we had to immediately think of a way of uh, coming up with a temporary roof cover so that once we started to un uh, remove the roofing and a storm came up, we could cover. The rotunda was occupied and used all this time, so that's why we had to work so hard to keep uh, the building protected. Uh, first step in the construction process was to remove these bottom two steps, uh, the, uh, concrete steps. On top left, that is the, uh, after uh, the 1976 work, after they finished pouring the steps out of cast concrete, here we're removing the bottom two because we found that there is a tension ring at this point around the building and in our probes, we discovered that it was severely damaged by rust from the leaking roof. Um, this is the remo after removal of the bottom two steps. Here we start to see evidence of a system that was designed by McKinney and White but never implemented. It was a system of skylights that were in the deck of the two steps. These are some of the nodules. Uh, Leo was telling me he has a couple of them from his work on the building. Um, they were just uh, dumped away in, in the crevices. The nodules were going to be, uh, the skylights were going to be uh, in these flat areas. Light, daylight was going to come through them, go through these arches, and then go through a glass ceiling above the galleries where daylight would have flooded the three decks, galleries of books. An ingenious Beaux Arts idea that they changed their mind during the construction process, didn't do it, and roofed over these elements. Um, we have exposed the, ta the, the, the tension ring and we are now uh, uh, taking the spall spalling off and coating it to protect it. The two steps are being reconstructed and we are removing the roofing insulation from the top part of the dome. This shows you with that removed the, the Guastavino tile dome that was uh, installed in 1897. <clears throat> 
In the meantime, uh, Lynch Roofing was our subcontractor, <laughs> wonderful roofing company. Uh, why the project, I think, is such a success. They did a mock-up for us in their shop uh, where we are looking at the details and making refinements to the design. Uh, back on site, we're starting to put in the series of uh, uh, furring strips and then wood sheathing. This provide, will provide a ventilation system underneath of the new copper roofing. It's something that the prior roof did not have. It was put directly onto the steps. You can't help get, but get condensation and vapor coming up from the building below. When it came up, it, it got to the backside of that sheet metal roofing, condensed, turned to water, and that roofing was really rusting from the inside out. Uh, this will keep that vapor from attaching to the underside of the, of the metal roofing. And now the sheet metal pans are going into place, uh, working their way up. At every uh, step, there is a lip that has a one inch continuous fence strip with bronze screening to allow that air to get into those uh, crevices behind the roof. Working on details such as built in gutters, uh, this man has a, a, a small uh, metal brake on site. Uh, Lynch, to facilitate the work, put up a large brake in a corner of the uh, scaffolding area and also a pre tinning uh, machine and was able to, to make all of their pans up there uh, for uh, right there on site. Um, continuing the work and the copper dome finished. Inside, the sc uh, skylight was replaced. The skylight that was there was from uh, 1897. Um, and was a dark brown uh, anodized aluminum skylight that was really inappropriate. This one's been modeled on a historic example at Daveridge Hall from the early 1820s, uh, done by, by uh, Latrobe. The going to the exterior uh, masonry, uh, it was all defined what needed to be done. You're seeing here damage, eroded joints from the water leakage through the roof, that has then left deposits of salt on top of the surfaces. Um, this is the Jefferson period brickwork. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, we call these ribbon joints. And you can see how the trowel has been cut below and above them to kind of create a shadow line. Uh, and then they're flattened. Uh, and then the head joints are very thin um, so that they don't read as strongly. It's a lovely. Uh, uh, Brickwork. When you're up there, just spend time looking at the at the brickwork up close on the pavilions and on the rotunda. This is what was done by McKim Mead White at the attic level in uh, 1897. All of this has been cut out and repointed to be closer to this, and this is a mock-up of, of their cutout um, work. And the Masons, wonderful Masons, Centennial out of Ohio, uh, did fantastic work. Uh, one of the probes we where we took off a uh, a stone cap from the water table. We were shocked to find that the actual water table is not bonded into the main wall of the building. It was actually constructed after the walls were put up uh, and appears to have been more ornamental than, um, than doing any functional, uh, uh, having any functional purpose. Uh, we also discovered that it was falling away from the building. There was about two inches of gap at the top where it's starting to lean out. So we needed to reconstruct that water table. Window sash were removed, taken off site for repair, stripping of paint. While they were gone, we had these plexiglass, plexiglass panels in place. Um, now for the sheet metal, what people often think is wood ornament on the outside of the building is actually sheet copper that's been pressed to these ornamental forms and then painted white. That was because in McKin when McKim Bean White reconstructed the building, the BOV gave them the directive, it will be a fireproof building. So no wood on the outside. Um, this is the upper cornice, the intermediate cornice, uh, the pediment uh, hood above the main floor level windows, frieze, and then architraves are the casings around the windows. All of them are sheet copper. And here we're testing many different methods of trying to remove the paint in situ from the, uh, the copper. We found with the pediment above the hood that actually its, uh, its fastening was, uh, had deteriorated and they were coming loose. So we had to take them off in total. 
When we realized that, um, we ended up taking, I'll, I'll show you, we, we took many of them off. This gives you an idea of some of the damage. Uh, around the mid 20th century, they took off the paint mechanically, used a five in one scraping tool, and just beat on the metal to, 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 to detach the paint from the subsurface and caused quite a bit of damage. This is inside that upper cornice, and it shows how it's constructed. These are wrought iron straps that are uh, bed within the masonry wall, and then the sheet metal ornament is hung off of them with these other straps. This is the intermediate cornice, which has a built-in uh, gutter, and here, because significant damage uh, had occurred within, within the built-in gutter, uh, within the, the entablature itself, made more so by the fact that it's wrapped in metal, so the water has nowhere to go. It just sits in there, and it, and it just rots the wood and creates a wonderful environment for, uh, for, for pests and, and rot. Um, what we found out is that these cast iron armatures um, were attached to the building with wooden, uh, by bolts into wooden pegs uh, in, the hole, in holes. The wooden pegs, because of the roof leakage, had rotted away in most cases, and the armatures were, start, were coming off of the building. This was more damage than we could do within the time limitation of getting done before graduation. So this work has been deferred to this next phase of work. We ended up taking off the architraves and the pediments taking them to a stripping shop in Manassas, American Stripping Company, an incredible place. They also do uh, uh, stripping uh, and metal repair of Calder statues. They're, they're surrounded by millions of dollars worth of sculpture. Um, we met on site to get to establish a level of repair that we wanted. Um, here is a photograph showing an open scene that has been repaired now. Um, and this is the before and after, one of the architraves with all the marks from, from paint, taking off the mechanical paint and now repaired and filled. Um, they, they did some wonderful improvements. On site, doing a mock-up of it all but going back in place and prepping for get, painting it before graduation and then we didn't make it. <laughs> I still think it was a lovely graduation and I, I think it looks great. Um, it will be painted. It was reaffirmed. Uh, what happened is that the, just the weather did not cooperate with us. We did not have the kind of dry days we needed before graduation. After graduation, it got so incredibly hot with the sun beating on, on it, we couldn't do it then. It's going to happen this fall in either September or October, but it will be painted. So since graduation and for the rest of the summer, up until the next couple of weeks, uh, the things we've been able to do is at the ground level, uh, replacing the water table. Here we're taking off the bricks, salvaging every one of them, uh, salvaging the stone caps, um, labeling them, marking them so they can go back right in their, the place they were, uh, where they originated. Uh, these are Dutchmen where severe damage to the caps, that damage has been cut out and we're replacing it with uh, sections of stone to fill it in. and the last of the work going up, and this is just from a couple days ago, uh, doing some touch-up, and we're demobilizing the lay-down area and sodding it and bringing it back. At this, as this first phase of exterior work comes to an end, architectural planning of the remaining renovation work is already well on the way, having started this past February. Just this summer, the state committed its share of the $43.45 million total budget for the remaining work. This coming week, we will submit the preliminary design package to the state for its review and approval. While funding was secured, we with funding secured, we anticipate completing working drawings and specs next spring. After bidding, construction should, follow, should begin following final exercises 2014 and take two years to complete. Last spring, after a two-month procurement process, the university hired Whiting Turner with offices in Richmond as the project's construction management firm. So what is the scope for the remaining $43 million worth of work? In essence, it covers the recommendations of the HSR left over after the current first phase of roof replacement and exterior repairs. They can be summarized as follows and summarized in five different categories that I'll go through. With the, first, with the phase one work now being completed, 
While the phase one work now being completed addressed the cylindrical drum of Jefferson's rotunda, the remaining exterior repairs tackle three main features, porticos, the four wings, and ornamental sheet metal cornices. The north portico will undergo extensive repairs to a severely deteriorated cast concrete structure. Marble steps and flooring at both porticos will be cleaned and repaired. Roofing and built-in gutters at both porticos will be replaced. Probes beneath the ornamental sheet metal wrapping the beams revealed rusting of the support steel, which will be fully exposed and repaired. The ornamental sheet metal will be paint stripped, repaired, and reinstalled. Lastly, for the porticos, and for, of special interest to most of us, the column capitals will be replaced. The black netting that has been in place for the past three and a half years has been protecting pedestrians from falling fragments of the deteriorating capitals. An extensive study by conservationists concluded that the Georgia marble used in the 1897 reconstruction cannot be preserved and, re and can cannot be preserved and repaired, but must be replaced. The four wings of the rotunda require extensive repairs and cleaning of brickwork, marble balustrades, windows, colonnade ceilings, and columns. The terraces above the wings will have their drainage systems corrected and then waterproofed. Deferred from the first phase of work, the ornamental sheet metal cornices of the drum will be stripped of multiple paint layers, repaired, repainted, and structurally reattached. The currently inconvenient and unreliable elevator will be replaced with a larger unit. Access at each floor will also be reconfigured to provide direct unattended usage by all people from public spaces. Right now at the main level, for instance, the uh, elevator is accessed through the BOV room. Um, it's what, we're, uh, what will be implemented is that the elevator will be increased in size and will have a small foyer that will go directly to the public corridor in the center. And, on, and, and most importantly, on the basement level, um, right now, to get handicapped access to, the, to use the elevator, they have to come inside, get a guide, go out, unlock a door from the Cryptoporticus, and go in the hallway to get to the elevator. Uh, in the, the uh, renovated building, you will have direct access to the elevator from the public area inside the building. The mechanical, electrical, lighting, plumbing, fire detection, sprinkler, data, security, and audiovisual systems are outdated, inadequate, or non-existent. Building systems were shoehorned into spaces in 1976, resulting in compromised maintenance and serviceability due to the, um, because of inaccessibility and non-code complying clearances. Due to the crowded conditions, the installed HVA system is rudimentary, providing the same temperature and volume of conditioned air to all spaces, regardless of individual room conditions. The results are uncomfortable rooms, mildew growth in poorly conditioned spaces, and wasted energy. A number of options to expand mechanical space were thoroughly studied, settling on a recommended approach that is hidden and minimizes damage to the historic building. This portion of the work is by far the most expensive with a project budget of nearly $24 million. One important guiding principle behind these renovations has been the directive to improve the university community's access to and use of the rotunda. Toward that end, some of the enhancements that will be implemented include change the fixed glass panels at the south portico entry to operable glass doors and an entrance. Increase classroom usage and quiet study space for students. Now these, I'm pleased to say that these first two recommendations um, have already been implemented in limited fashion. Um, after spring break last year, uh, the glass doors were reopened and are now uh, a public entrance. Um, and it's absolutely astounding that you go down the South Lawn and you can go where the architecture tells you to go and actually enter the building there <laughs> instead of going uh, in the basement and coming up through the bowels of the building. 
Uh, there was an editorial in yesterday's Cavalier Daily where the, uh, the writer uh, complimented the, uh, this achievement and called the doors beforehand ornamental, not functional. Uh, and classroom usage. The Lower West Oval Room is now being used for classes Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays, every week, and will remain so all through this academic year. Um, access and use of the lower level gallery in the dome room. This, uh, this is the dome room, and it's this gallery. We're going to be putting in a stair to that gallery. There's going to be furniture, chairs, tables, and that will be open and available for student study area. Uh, I should have mentioned, too, that the dome room has also now uh, been open for student study at night. We have now security uh, entry systems on the doors and the bathrooms so that students can come in here and use this space at night for studying. Handicapped uh, access to the terraces and South Portico entry will enlarge and remodel the restrooms, will improve the visitor center and museum, will replace the metal ceiling panels in the dome room that were put in in 1976 with acoustical plaster, will provide a shading device at the dome room oculus to allow daytime projection. And lastly, we'll increase the storage and preparation space for catering and other services supporting large events. There's over 120 major dinners a year in the Rotunda. And it's in a very important space for people to want to be in. They need the kind of support to be able to do those functions. Right uh, in the 76 work, this was the only space given to catering. Um, it is next to the men's bathroom underneath the south stair, uh, across the Crypt of Porticos from the building. Hardly convenient uh, and hardly large enough. Right now, catering has to take two, and three, two or three bays of the dome room to just to store their equipment and tables. Um, it's not attractive. Uh, when they do plating, uh, when they have dinners in the lower two floors, they have to set up their plating operation in the Cryptoporticus outside. All year long, they're out there. Um, and that's also next to the trash cans on the other side. Not the best situation. Currently, a cultural landscape report is in progress with scheduled completion next spring. The recommendations from that report will inform decisions regarding renovations to the east and west courtyard landscapes and possibly to the north terrace. I hope I've been able to convey something of the paradox that is the rotunda. This pile of bricks, wood, steel, and copper that generations of Virginians have reformed into an iconic symbol believed to be frozen from Jefferson's time has actually experienced tragedy, abuse, and frequent change, sometimes violent. Change is not inherently bad, and in fact, for a historic building such as the Rotunda that continues to serve the university since its 1827 construction, it's absolutely necessary. Renovations currently underway preserve the World Heritage Site for generations to come while accommodating the infrastructure and program support changes that will keep the Rotunda a vital participant in Mr. Jefferson's university. Thank you all. So we're going to take a few questions here. If you'll just raise your hand, I'll bring this around to you. Oh, and I said it should have said, go who's. The extent of the damage makes me raise the question, what is going on in the rest of the pavilions? We had the collapse of one of the uh, terraces a few years back, uh, as you know. And uh, one has to wonder, with all this falling apart, is the whole structure in danger? The pavilions are in much better shape. Um, we've actually, over the last few years, restored, renovated, completely renovated three pavilions, um, uh, nine, ten, and uh, which, what's the, oh, uh, five. So we've, we've actually 
uh, done very well in keeping up with the pavilions. And that's because there, there is something called a historic preservation funds um, that accumulate uh, 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 interest and money. And we're able to use the interest off of those funds, so it allows us to be able to do smaller projects. The pavilions are usually one to three million dollars a piece for their total rehabilitation, but we keep up with them very well. We have a program that we started uh, two years ago to restore the flat roof sections between the pavilions over top of the, the student dorm rooms. Um, and that makes a, a, an amazing difference um, in one's perception of, of the university, because for the first time, I, I, I'm the, the, the gabled roofs over top the dorm rooms were actually put in in the late 1830s because the flat roofs that Jefferson designed leaked like sieves. Um, and so we have restored one section back to the flat roof. And when you're up there, all of a sudden you're part of the lawn and the gardens at the same time instead of just being on the lawn side looking at this gable roof over here. Um, so the, the rest of the, the, the academic village isn't much better. We just replaced the slate roofing on the West Range this summer. Um, much better shape than the Rotunda. Rotunda, because it's such a large project, we just could not handle it in bits and pieces. Yeah, we knew that there was damage going on, and we had to wait till we had a, a capital program uh, devised and ready to go. Thanks, Jody, for your presentation. Uh, a couple of quickies, and you can see where it might lead. Um, is the uh, relative to the pavilions? Is the beige on Pavilion Ten will be serially introduced as the new lawn color? Um, and what has your research indicated about um, in prominent buildings painting uh, copper and how that holds up and what the s painting cycle would be? And um, thanks. <laughs> good. My memory's not that good. Uh, the beige color that is on Pavilion 10, that was uh, finished three years ago. Uh, they are the accurate colors. We had three different paint analysts uh, uh, research those colors. Um, and it, it, we, we, we suspected and, and that there was a, lot, a, a, a more stone color. And you, ha you have to remember that Jefferson was replicating Greek and Roman ruins and, and, and classical architecture. So in the, that kind of architecture, what he constructed out of wood would have been constructed out of stone. Um, and it's just been, and, and you can see through the layers, uh, through the 30, 35 layers of paint that has gone, that have gone on over time, it has just gradually each year gotten a little lighter, a little lighter, a little lighter, until now we put on refrigerator white. Um, and people like it, but it's not historically accurate. When we did, Pavi we did Pavilion 10 block to start the conversation, to let people know. So many people come to the university in the academic village and they think, well, this is exactly how Jefferson left it. You'd be shocked at the differences uh, there are between now and Jefferson's period. Um, and so we just wanted to start the conversation. A moratorium was put on for expanding that color anywhere else until we've all had a chance to, uh, to talk about it and decide together. So it, it's, it's, no, there are no plans to continue uh, the beige anywhere else. Um, the other question was the, the cycle for this roof. This is a floor, uh, 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 Coraflon is the name. It's a PPG product that the, the roof will be painted. It's an, actually a 30-year uh, life cycle. Um, it's a chemical bond, um, and we paint the, the, the architraves and all the, the metal ornament that has been put back uh, were painted with the same thing. So it's a very long-lasting uh, material product. Other prominent buildings paint. Even the, the Coraflon uh, literature doesn't mention copper as a possible substrate because who the hell would paint copper? <laughs> <laughs> we do. <laughs> um, so, but, but we've checked with the manufacturers and it's perfectly appropriate. They said, sure, you want to do it. it can, <laughs> it'll, it'll be fine. Yeah. Uh, thank you and your entire team for this tremendously important uh, 
uh, work on a United Nations World Heritage Site. Uh, we owe you tremendous debt. Thank you. Uh, and I think future generations of Americans and people interested in historic architecture and World Heritage Sites throughout the world owe you and uh, your team a debt. You're very kind. Thank you. And I should say, I am part of a team. Thank you for reminding me. Um, I have in my team in facilities planning and construction uh, two other members that work uh, with me, James Zemer and Kate Meyer. And then the preservation team actually combines people out of the University Architect's Office. Brian Hogg is the senior preservation planner. Mark Cutney is the conservator. And I and Mary Hughes is a landscape uh, architect. And we are considered to be the preservation team at the, at the university. And I just have a question about uh, the capitals. Uh, First of all, I'm thrilled, although I realize the need for safety of visitors and students and others. Uh, the the uh, rotunda has seemed in mourning for three and a half years. Um, and what, what material is it known that Jefferson used there, and what material do you plan to use on the capitals? Well, we know exactly what he used because we have it sitting in Bailey um, uh, Courtyard. It was a Carrera marble out of, out of Italy. He contracted through, uh, uh, I think it was the American ambassador or, or uh, liaison with Italy at the time, to have Italian carvers carve those capitals. It's a, it's a longer story than that because first he thought he was going to be able to use local stone. So he brought over Italian carvers and, and they have ended up settling here and part of the community ever since. Um, and, but the stone here was so poor that uh, they couldn't do the, the fine Corinthian acanthus leaf carving with it. So he ended up uh, contracting and getting them brought over. Uh, they were in two sections um, for each capital and shipped over, brought up by wagon from, from Richmond and uh, installed. Um, and we are looking at not only uh, our consultant in terms of a replacement marble is looking not only at Carrera but also uh, at Vermont. Vermont has a very fine uh, uh, marble as well. The Georgia marble, the problem with it is that it's, it's more porous. And what was happening is that um, it was absorbing moisture and the, 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 the pollution, the hot foot that we put on to keep uh, pigeons off, none of that helped. Um, and it was absorbing the water and then through freeze-thaw cycles starting to disintegrate from inside. And we, we actually looked into, well, can we consolidate them and repair the missing pieces on the outside? Um, and ended up finding out that, yeah, you could do that, but it's still, you can't consolidate them all the way through, and you still take the chance of them falling apart. So that's when we decided that we needed to replace them. Great. So I think we have time for just a couple more questions. We've got one over here. Uh, did you tell us what the original cost was for Mr. Jefferson's rotunda? I should know this, and it's well documented, but I don't know it off the top of my head. I'm sorry. I, I'm... I'm very sorry. I don't know. It would be a guess on my part, and I wouldn't want to do that. Um, but I'd be glad to give me your name afterwards, and I'll be glad to, to uh, send it to you in an email. I can find out. I know that the work in 1976 was $2.5 million, the 76 uh, uh, restoration. Oh, this is... Um, uh, an etching, a, a gentleman sent this to me. He's in the Center for Politics, uh, Damon Irby, and he has a hobby of doing etch -a sketches. And, um, and he sent this to me just out of the blue, and uh, it's wonderful. I think it's a, uh, a statement of how pervasive the rotunda is as a symbol here at the university. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you. This presentation was an absolute treasure. Thank um, you. I just had a quick question. Why were the skylights on the roof never implemented? Um, we, have a rec we have a letter from Stanford White. They had constructed, put them in, and for them to work, they would have had to bring the inner dome. There's actually two domes. There are two Guastavino tile domes. There's one on the top. That they're about uh, six inches apart at the top and about eight inches apart at the bottom. That second dome would have had to come to the front of the galleries. Um, so if you can picture those, those galleries inside the dome room, the galleries are about uh, 10 foot wide, and that inner dome would have had to come to the front of the galleries so that then the glass ceiling between the inner dome and the outer would allow the natural light to come through and, 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 and wash the galleries. Stanford Wright in the letter says, 
I changed my mind, it would look too silo-like to do that. So he was worried about the proportions of the room, and he ended up uh, putting, putting this, the inner dome back to the outside. Do you, do you know, um, since the building has expanded significantly from the original Jefferson design, some the, the wings and, and connecting porticos and all of that create a whole different situation for landscaping. So I'm interested in kind of how they're going to approach redoing the landscape when it's the building itself is so different than than what Mr. Jefferson designed and therefore landscape. The uh, what is happening now is there is a, 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 a consultant that has been <coughs> working for the past year accumulating the evidence and information for how landscapes have changed here at the university over time. And that's the first step to then deciding, well, what do you want to do? Um, and this consultant will, as at the end of, uh, of their work, make recommendations for what they think would be appropriate for the buildings as they are now. And I suspect, I mean, there's Jefferson's landscape was just there. There was none on the backside of these buildings. It was the it was the backyard. It, it, it was um, helter skelter, um, and so I suspect it might be something uh, leaning towards the McKinley and White uh, uh, plans for the landscape. But that's speculation on my part. Please don't write that up and tell everybody it's going to look like McKinley and White. But th that's a that's a difficult decision. I, I and it's just as important. As the, as the buildings to me. Um, it, it's, the context is, is extremely important. Yes, sir. Is this the most complex building that Jefferson designed? And how does that compare to his own house in terms of how that's been maintained over the years? Oh, his house has been maintained very well. It's, it's the lovely. Okay. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the question is, is this the most uh, complicated building Jefferson designed? Um, and how does this compare to the upkeep uh, condition of Monticello? Uh, Monticello is well taken care of. They have uh, their own um, uh, funding sources, and they do very well. Uh, it's a smaller building to take care of, so they're, 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 they're the... the um, the, they're focused. Yes, he has the wings and he has the flat roofs also, but it, it's uh, uh, much smaller in, in scope than here. Um, this the most complicated building? Uh, I'm, I'm this or the state capitol? Um, the state capitol to me uh, is a more complicated building because it's, uh, it, ha it, had to it had to accommodate more uses inside. They had the three-part uh, uh, governmental system that had to be put into a Roman temple. You know, the, the, the uh, Nims uh, uh, temple uh, is what it's modeled after. And so he had to come up with a way to get three different uh, 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 governmental functions inside, and he has a dome in there. Uh, and it's hard to believe that there's a dome within a building that's shaped like a temple, but there actually is. So I, I think that's a little bit more complicated in terms of, of uh, adapting the uses to the building. The, 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 uh, this, this, the, uh, I like this better because it's cleaner and, and, it, and it expresses inside what you see outside, you know, the dome room. Um, Monticello was his experiment. Monticello, to me, gets a little fussy. If, if you ever look at a roof plan of Monticello, uh, it's just there's stuff everywhere. And, and he's just trying everything on Monticello. Um, so I, I. Yeah. Yes, sir. All, right. All right. We have, I think the first gentleman was asking the question that's on in everybody's head is why create more maintenance? Why not leave the roof as copper? That's question one. Question two was, what in the world are the tension rods for? Is that tying the brick wall in? I'm and sorry, number, I didn't catch the second part. The the, what? what What are the tension rings for? Are they to tie the walls in, or is that a method that's holding the, the sections of roof up? And then the third question is, since when did 1976 become ancient history, and you actually lost track of what you found out in 1976? I know we drank a lot back then, but... <laughs> We actually just, just have uh, found a trove of, of fantastic photographs. Uh, Giannini uh, was involved with the work then, and he took lots of photographs, 
And they've been in special collections, but they, but they haven't been cataloged. And so we pressed to have them cataloged and, 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 and uh, gotten to us. And they have, and it's, it's been a, a wealth of information. They did not document things well back then. Uh, preservation has gone through um, a, a, a very big change from, and, and I started working in preservation in, in 1970, so, so I, I'm familiar with this. Um, we thought if we were doing it, we'd all remember forever. And there was no need to document. And we didn't do such things as historic structure reports. Um, now we know better uh, because of such things as, well, what did they do in 76? And, and there, you know, we're try we, we've interviewed people who were still with uh, R.E. Lee uh, at the time to try and find out. Um, they just didn't document things well. Thank God there was someone taking photographs. Um, your other questions? Detention rings. Jefferson, and, and this is a fascinating part of the story, Jefferson had put in two tension rings, um, at, and the tension rings are uh, continuous steel, uh, in his case, wrought iron rings that keep the dome from pressing out, because there's a lateral load with the dome. It's there, there's a, a, a straight down load, but there's also a lateral load. And one, it wants to push on the walls and push them out. The tension rings keep that constrained. There's also at the top of the oculus a compression ring, which uh, all the structure sits against. Jefferson's dome was a DeLorme dome. It was made up of wood, laminated wood ribs that were then had purlins between them, and then wood sheathing, and then his uh, zinc-coated uh, 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 iron shingles that you see on some of the, the pavilions now. Um, why paint the roof? I, I've been told to paint the roof by the BOV. 